Whoa, what an incredible kickoff to our Crossroads tailgate party. My name is Isaac and I'm so excited for you to be here and I'm with my incredible co-host Kia and we have a great morning in store for you. That's right, Isaac. We have a lot of great things planned, so let's get straight to it. First off, this is a tailgate for everyone, no matter your race, sexuality, gender, ethnicity, athletic ability. It's a good thing, because we invited you. Oh, have you seen me try and throw something into a wastebasket? I sure have, and it's not a sight to be seen, but I've also seen you be incredibly welcoming to all. So when you say that we're welcoming to all, I know that you actually mean it. And speaking of being welcoming, let's introduce the home team, shall we? Sure. First off, we've got Mickey on keys, guitar, and a couple other instruments. And you should see him on the guitar. Oh, I bet. I, I know. And uh, bringing the thunder from behind the shield is Dave the Mulvinator. Adding international flair to acoustic guitar and vocals are Simon and Nayeli. And anchoring the vocal lineup, we have Rookie of the Year, Anna. Bringing the funk to the bass line is Kellen. And finally, shredding the gnar on the axe. I'm, I'm being told that's an electric guitar. Uh, that's, uh, that is John. Interpreting what's happening on stage is Wendy. And rounding out the home team lineup and going deep just a little bit later from center stage is our guest speaker, Ricky Bolden, all the way from Washington, D.C. Now that you know who's on the field, here's what you can expect from today's tailgate. We'll have some more music. And you'll get to meet the away team going all the way to Puerto Rico. Wow, that's far. It is. And now we'll send you out for the start of the second quarter. Take it away, team. to stand up now stand up now you all must have the quietest super bowl parties ever in the history of super bowl parties so uh you're gonna help us out here we're gonna bring ricky up onto the stage do a little interview some football talk but he's kind of a prima donna he won't come up until you're cheering loud enough for him i don't know it's kind of weird he's been successful enough in life it wouldn't matter but all right here we go uh sing with us here we go whoa come on just pretend like the broncos are winning can we bring our hands up high? We want to welcome to the stage none other than our good friend Ricky Bolden, who played in the league for six years, has won 85 championships, is uh, currently the king of all things NFL, living in D.C. We're so glad you're here. Give Ricky a great big hand. Wow. That is amazing. All right. Go ahead and have a seat, everybody. Yes. Well, we wanted to, uh, we're, we're about done with the first half already. Yes. So uh, we, got, we got five <laughs> minutes here in the first half. My understanding, Ricky, is they're going to give us a two-minute clock. Oh, my. In this little interview that we're doing here. So we're going to have to go into a two-minute drill. And you do have one timeout. Oh, my. During that two we minutes. We can make that work. So if you want to, to have a little bit longer answer, you're going to call that 30-second timeout, and we'll give you an extra That's 30 it. seconds. Thank you, brother. All right? But uh, maybe, Ricky, for those of you that, for the folks that don't know you, you've been with us a few years here on uh, Super Bowl Sunday. Yes, um, yes. And, uh, but for those that don't know, tell everybody a little bit about Ricky Bolden. Growing yes. up, the football career, what you're doing now, yeah. I was born and raised in Dallas, Texas. Uh, played football at a small college in Dallas, Texas, Southern Methodist University. Uh, I was drafted from Southern Methodist to Cleveland and played six years. I retired in my seventh year. Uh, I was going to seminary uh, while I was playing in Cleveland and then I became a pastor right after uh, I retired. I pastored for about 20, 22 years and then now I'm working in Washington, D.C and I work with leaders. And so whether it be uh, leaders in the community, uh, I have a Bible study with a number of congressmen that we meet uh, every week that they're in town and they're in session. And I'm just really excited. I go all over the country meeting with the leaders and whether it be ambassadors or presidents or whatever, but I'm like, I am the most blessed man you have ever seen. That's good. Now, Ricky, what are some of your favorite memories from playing in the NFL? Oh my, I do have one, and I'm telling you, if I would have known, I would have brought the video. Just look at it on YouTube. <laughs> I caught one touchdown my entire career. Amen, amen, <laughs> amen. And it was a tackle eligible, so tackles never get to catch touchdowns. 
But, you know, every time I pull that video, you should see my kids. They're like, Dad, not again, Dad, not again. Please don't do it to us. They don't like seeing it very much. That's good. Now, uh, you, you had a little, uh, a little run-in with the Denver Broncos this past year, correct? Oh, help them, Lord. Help them, Lord. Help so them tell Lord. us a little bit about that. You know what? I, enjoy, I do chapel services all the time. If a, lead, if a team comes to Washington, D.C. area, they may call me and say, Rick, could you do a chapel service? And this year, the Baltimore Ravens played the Broncos, and the chaplain called me to do it. And it was just so amazing. Uh, I was sitting in the chapel service waiting for the guys to come in. And a number of your players, you've got some godly people on that team. And I was really surprised at how, how excited Russell Wilson is about the Lord. I mean, we, he sat there and just talked about his dependency and his strength on the Lord. But I did get surprised because after I was talking with the players, the coaches started to come in. And I started hearing the coaches talk. And one of the coaches said, Last year, he was a high school coach, and I'm like, uh, can you believe that? <laughs> no wonder they're losing. You know. What I mean? <laughs> and they had a number of college coaches, and it just messed my head up because it didn't make sense to me. And let me give you an example. Uh, you get a guy, and I don't know how you feel about Deion Sanders, but you know, I know he's, uh, ex amen, amen. But let me tell you, he is a gem for this state. You are going to be so proud of him because the first thing Dion did was he went to the NFL and he started recruiting coaches from the NFL because your best coaches are in the NFL, not in high school. <laughs> and he just, he stacked his coaching staff and you, those guys, their playing ability is going to just simply, they're going to, it's going up like you have never seen before. And I don't care that team is going to win the season coming up. I know it will. <laughs> so, so you went and did a chapel service. You, did, you prayed for the Denver Broncos. Oh, there, yeah, listen, listen. Time. I laid hands on them. I prayed in the name of Jesus. I even tried to cast out demons. I was doing it all. <laughs> it's, it's, it's my estimation, though, that... Uh, it didn't help at all. Oh, no, it no, no. It actually hurt them. So please no, stop no, praying for no, the Denver Broncos. Yeah. No, it didn't hurt them. I mean, they had all that lousy talent before I got there. <laughs> <laughs> Ricky, maybe, um, what are, maybe, a hand, maybe some relationships that developed that carried through your football career, even till today. And like, what was maybe the glue that held those relationships together for you? Did you have like maybe a significant person in your life while you were in the league that, that is still a part of your life perhaps? Yeah, I really have, I really have uh, two relationships. One is a guy named Tom Petersburg. Now Tom can't see anymore because he's about 75, 78. He can't see anymore, but Tom led me to the Lord my first year in the NFL. And I just won't ever forget, you know, I went in and he was speaking in a Bible study. And he went over this wonderful verse, trust in the Lord with all of your heart, lean not on your own direction, but in all of your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. And man, that just, I mean, I was a guy that was trusting in my own ability, my own gifts, my own talent. And for the first time I had to really, really come to terms with me running my life or was I going to give my life up for someone else to run? And that changed my life forever. And so Tom would, would be that person that really impacted my life and continues to be in my life today. Mm, that's fantastic. Okay, so we're at a minute 24 here. Yes. All yeah. right. So probably, Time out. Time yeah, out. Oh, you, I haven't even time had that question. Yeah, okay, good. No, no, I, I know you. <laughs> time out. I need some more time. All right, so we're going we're gonna to stop the clock. Right? Yes. <laughs> um, so here's, here's the question I have for you, Ricky. Uh, as you're thinking about what's next for Ricky and the work that you're doing there in D.C., uh, what, what, what vision do you have for where things are headed, the leadership, the, the influence? It's, we've come out of COVID, the, some of the right. work that is transitioned and is different now, but what's, what's next? What do you feel like God's yes. doing, calling you to next? Yes, you know what? I really do believe that God is calling me to have more influence around the world. You know, I was telling, I was telling Ryan, that this past week, uh, this gentleman from, uh, from Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo came to town and for some reason, uh, he called me and wanted a meeting with me. And I was like, wow, what in the world does he want to meet with me for? And when I get there, he was, he's really, his life has been threatened in the Congo. And so I was able to go on, on the hill with him and I had a lot of friends and they wrote letters to the current president 
And now, you know, he said he, he thinks his life's going to be okay. And so I really think that me just traveling and saying, God, how do, in the world do I impact the world? You know, John 3.16, a lot of people focuses on the back end of John 3.16, but I love the front part of John 3.16. For God so loved the world. And a lot of times we think that God only loves America or God only loves, loves Christians. Or, and if you're acting the, the way that we want you to act, he really loves you. And that is not how God is. God loves the world. There are 7.7 billion people in this world. God loves everyone in one eternal act. And so I don't care who you are, if you black or white, if you're old or young, if you gay or straight, if you, I don't care who you are. God loves you so much. In fact, you know what you are? Hey, man, that's good. And the, and, and the greatest thing that you can probably do about right now is just to hug yourself and say, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Isn't that good? Come on, hug yourself real quick. I, love it. I don't care who you are. God has this great love for you. And you've got to believe that. Okay. Oh, that's awesome. All right. Well, Ricky will be back out in a, just a little bit to continue our series, The Way of Peace. Boy, and, you really uh, had a job, hope. didn't you? Don't distract her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, All I don't know how I could have that job. Everybody. Oh. <laughs> he said, don't distract her. from our star quarterback ending out the first half here on a high note. That's right, Isaac. I'm excited to see what else he will do in the second half. That's right, Kia. Right now, let's take a look at what's happening around the rest of the league. We'll send it out to the Student Center for our halftime report. Hi, Crossroads. Here's your halftime tailgate report brought to you by Crossroads Students. <laughs> We meet every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. right here in the Student Center with Student Adventures first Sunday of every month. Learn more at crossroadscolorado.com slash students. Make sure you have a program this morning. It's a great weekly resource for everything you need to know around the Crossroads Network. For digital resource, go to crossroadscolorado.com slash gather. If you didn't get a program at the beginning of the tailgate, raise your hand and the room host will bring one to you. Inside your program is a connect card. This is for everyone to fill out every week. If you're a regular attender, just put your name and check the box regular attender. If you're new here or a guest, share as much info as you're comfortable and check the appropriate box. Hang on to that card until the end of the service because you might want to add more as the tailgate continues. Also inside that program is a giving envelope. We try to make giving as easy and convenient as possible. Our host will be around later in the service to collect giving envelopes and connect cards or you can drop them in the orange drop boxes on your way out. Thank you for your generosity. The next Crossroads Adventure Days are just around the corner on February 20th and 21st. At Adventure Days, kids ages 5 to 13 get a fun day camp experience on those weird days off of school when parents and caregivers might be looking for a safe and fun child care option. Grab your spot now at crossroadscolorado.com slash adventure days. 
The season of Lent is in 40 days leading up to Easter. It starts on February 22nd for this year's Lent journey. We're working through the book, The Art of Lent, with daily email reflections written by Crossroads members. You can pick the book up in the atrium today. If you'd like to join the journey and receive the daily reflections, check the box on your Connect card or go to crossroadscolorado.com slash Lent to get started. Happy tailgate, Crossroads! Go team! So let me just, I'm, I want a quick assessment. How many of you think the Philadelphia Eagles will win today? How many of you think the Kansas City Chiefs will win today? Wow. Now I look at the game today from a totally different perspective. I have, there's never been two African-American quarterbacks playing in the Super Bowl. So I don't care who wins, I'm just excited to be there. And who would have ever thought that in um, Black History Month that these two guys would be playing? And I want to tell you, I don't know who's going to win, but I know they both have great teams. And so you're going to be excited. So now remember, you're going to have to help me out if you want to get out here early. Amen. <laughs> amen. That means that you're going to have to say amen every once in a while. Now, if you don't, if, if I say something that you enjoy or that you appreciate, you say amen. Now, if I say something that you don't agree with, you say, help him, Lord, just help him, Lord, help him, Lord. And I can take that. Is that all right? So I want to, I, I, I really said, I, I, last time I went a little over. But this time I'm going to try to be 15 minutes. Amen, 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 amen. Because, you know, I really want to get us out of here so that we can get to the Super Bowl. But the reality is I have never in my life preached a sermon that short. And so you probably won't get it today either. Amen. <laughs> amen. So let's get going. Right, let me open us up in a word of prayer. Jesus, we're so excited about meeting you here this morning. You teach us in your word that where two or three are gathered, that you're in your name, that you're here with us. Father, therefore, we welcome your presence here this morning. Show up and show out and do what only you can do in this place. Encourage those who need to be encouraged this morning. Strengthen those who need to be strengthened and, and motivate those who need to be motivated. And Jesus, please provide for our needs this morning whether they be financial, social, emotional, whatever, please provide. Jesus, there might be someone here that just kind of slipped in that needs hope. That, Father, they might be living in a hopeless situation. We pray that, Father, you will meet that need right where they are. To you be honor, glory, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now, you know, let me tell you, I am, I am so excited about this series that we are on a journey of peace. In fact, everyone here, we are peacemakers. And on this journey as peacemakers, we are to impact this community and this entire city and this entire state like never before as peacemakers. And here's the reality, that's the way of Jesus. That if you really want to see who Jesus really, really was, Jesus was a peacemaker. 92 times in the book of Luke, Jesus talked about peace because he was a peacemaker. And what you're saying is, Jesus, I want to follow in your way, and I want to do it the way you did it. And so I'm so excited. Now, I must tell you, one of the great qualities of peace is this word called hope, and that's what I've been assigned to this morning. And I don't care where you are this morning, if you don't have hope, you give up. And so what I want to do is I want to quickly uh, define this word hope. I want us to all be on the same page. I want to define this word hope, and, and then, I wanna, then I'm, then I'm going to quickly just jump in and give you a few principles that we can apply to because all of us are ambassadors of hope. When we leave these doors, people should be, they should see us as lights of hope. 
that people who are ready to give up, they should see us and change their minds and say, you know, I can't do that because someone with hope impacted my life. Now, I want to confess, I do think I am the most qualified person to preach this message. Amen. Isn't that good? No, really, because I, I am one of these guys that, that I've gone through so much drama and trauma in my life that I always needed ambassadors of hope. I don't know about you, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm from the hood. Amen, amen, amen. You all, do you all know what I'm talking about when I say the hood? Yeah. Hood just simply means the neighborhood in the inner city. That's all it is. But I'm straight up from the hood. But in the hood I grew up in, there was all of this pain and there was all this tension. But if I did not have these ambassadors of hope, I wouldn't have made it. When I was 11 years old, I just remember so clearly my father, Isaac Bolden, and you know, my mama came home and said, you know, he's got lung cancer and he's not gonna be here much longer. And then when he died, I had this lady named Bessie Jones come along and said, you can make it. You're gonna be all right. I was ready to give up. I'm like, man, Dad, how in the world am I going to make it as a young man in the inner city? But I had this ambassador that came along and said, you're going to be okay. I remember when my baby brother Charles, just two years later, I was 13, he picked up a pistol and put it to his head and pulled the trigger. And I'm like, how do I make it through this? How do I get out of this? And all of a sudden, there was an ambassador of hope that came across the street that hugged me. I said, you're going to be all right. And then, and, then, and, then, and then when I was all of a sudden, I'm 15 years old, my brother Wallace, he was my closest brother. My mother had 10 babies in 10 years. My brother Wallace went to prison. And my brother was 17 years old, a kid, and went to prison. He got out, he got shot 13 times and beaten the head with a shovel. And you know who showed up? An ambassador of hope. Someone that extended hope to me and said, Ricky, you're going to make it. And then I remember when I got shot walking through the inner city of Dallas, Texas, and a guy pulled a gun and shot me. And I said, man, listen, I'm an all-American athlete. And here it is, walking down the street, I get shot. How can that happen? And I was trying to give up, but you know what? Someone like you, an ambassador of hope, they came along and they ministered to me and they, t- they, they, and they let me know everything's going to be all right. And when mama passed at 28, just always there was someone that was there to give hope. And that's what you've been called to. That's why you're in this city, in this county. You're here to give hope. If you're in high school, guess what you're there for? You are there and you have your antennas up because there will be people that will be coming through and they need hope on your jobs, in your colleges, wherever you are. We are ambassadors of hope. So let me hear up. Now, you know that, you you know that's all introduction. That doesn't really count, right? And so, and so, so my, my 15 minutes is going to start. I'll tell you when it starts in just a minute. <laughs> and so what I want to do is I want to I define hope. I want to tell you what hope is, because once I define hope, we can all be on the same page. You know, I'm not, I was thinking about, you know, maybe I'll give a real good theological term. And I'm like, nah, nah, nah. I'm from the hood. I'm going to give them something easy. So, 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 so I, want, I want you to check out this wonderful definition of hope that I got that's real good. It says, it said, hope is the confident expectation, the sure certainty that what God has promised in his word is true. Amen, amen. Amen. Let let me give you an example. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy will come in the morning. That's hope. And so when you can go in, and I don't care how painful it gets at night, when you can look up and say, I don't care what I'm going through now because soon joy is on its way. That's hope. Amen. Amen. And that's what God calls us to. Now, now, now this is what, how I define it if I had to go and talk about it. I would say hope is all about the future. That's what hope is. Hope is, is you looking and saying, okay, okay, my tomorrow is going to be better than my today. Mm, mm, mm. Isn't that good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That what I encounter tomorrow is going to be better than what's going on in my life today. And so no matter what I'm going through today, I can still stand tall because tomorrow is coming. Isn't that good? Oh, well, I'll just give you a quote if you act like you don't know what I'm talking about. Let me give you a quote. It says, hope is important because it can make the present moment less difficult to bear. 
if we believe that tomorrow will be better, we can bear a hardship today. Isn't that good? That tomorrow will be better, therefore we can bear, we, we, we're going to be able to bear. And so let me just hair up and give you this here. And so, and so, and so, so let me explain, so let me tell you real practically. Hope is saying, I may be going through in my marriage. This crackpot that I married has just got to be crazy. <laughs> but I'm going to be all right because tomorrow God's going to, he's going to, he's going to touch his heart. That's hope. Oh, 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 what about my body is physically down? I may have arthritis, I may have bad joints or whatever, but tomorrow I'm going to be better. Or maybe you can go in and look politically and say, man, this world is going to chaos. But you know what? Because of God's power, it's going to be better tomorrow. Or you may just go in and say, okay, okay, look at my children now. They are tripping and they've gone crazy. And you may say, amen, amen. amen. But you know what, though? They may be crazy today, but tomorrow they're going to work it out. And so that's what hope is. Hope is saying, how in the world do I look to the future and know that God is not only in my present, he's also in my future, and that God is going to work it out. And so what I did today was I got this wonderful passage of Scripture that I'm going to read, and it's really about this brother who was hopeless. Because hopelessness is the opposite of hope. Can you see that? Let I tell you, show you the difference. Let me show it to you. Hope says, my tomorrow will be better than my today. Hopeless says, I have got so much going on in my life today, I don't even have the strength to look to tomorrow. Amen. That was good, wasn't it? Let me say that again for you. <laughs> Hope says that my tomorrow is going to be better than my today. But hopelessness says that, that I've got so much in my heart and in my mind that is challenging me, I don't have the strength to look even for tomorrow. See, your today is di dictating your life. So let's just go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this guy named Gideon, and this guy was hopeless. And I want to show you how, as, as, as ambassadors of hope, how we can go in, and I want you to see the type of people God expects you to minister to. Is that all right? Hey, come on, amen, help me out. Okay, so here you go. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Judges chapter 6, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 7, and then, I'll, and then I, and I'll tell you. If you have your Bible or your iPhone or whatever, unfortunately, because, you know, I'm from the hood, I didn't send them my notes, so I'm just going to have to read the Scriptures for you. Amen, amen, amen. So listen to the Scripture. Here it comes. And so, 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 so this wonderful verse, I'm sorry, I'm starting with verse 11. It says, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to jo Joash the Abzerite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now listen to this. Verse 13. P -p Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all these wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? P -p Pardon me, my Lord. Gideon replied, How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites leaving none alive. Ooh, mm -mm. isn't that good? <laughs> Amen. So, 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 so if I had to give you an overall topic for my passage, let me tell you what, the, what I would call it. I would say uh, this, that these are principles that empower peacemakers to walk in and minister hope. Isn't that good? Yeah, no, no, no. See, you're the peacemaker. And what the principles today is going to empower you.
to walk in and minister hope to a world that's dying. So let me just die in. So the first principle is I said this. I mean, you got to hear it. Thank you, brother. You're all right. That's cool. It says, it says, a peacemaker that walks in hope cannot allow his condition to dictate his position. Mm, mm, mm. Isn't that good? That a peacemaker, as you walk in hope, you can never allow your condition to dictate your position. Now, in order to understand this, you got to first understand the condition that Gideon was working in. Listen to what the condition was. In, 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 in the first seven verses, it says, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern people invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts, it was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land and ravaged it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. Uh, 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 isn't that an ugly condition? That's an ugly condition. Can you imagine being there? Here it is that this is a group of people that God called his chosen people. And now they're out on the land. They built these temporary homes. And now you've got three groups of people. They come and they ravage the land. They tear up their crops. They kill all their animals. And they're sitting up here like, oh, what are we going to do? And day after day after day after day, they show up and they destroy the people in their land. That's the reason to be depressed. Now, I don't know about you, but a lot of times... You know what he's talking about, right? I know I've been married for 36 years. And every once in a while I look over and like, oh Lord, because I know it's gonna be a tough day with Glenda. Now I have more happy days than tough days, but I know it's tough. Or sometimes when we go through some, my body's getting older. And I know that, you know, like I played football and I broke my body up pretty good. I have a pin in this shoulder and I, I have a play nate screws in this leg, dislocated the ankle. I broke this leg, two knee scopes, broken thumb, broken arm, broken shoulder. And my body doesn't feel good. And sometimes I can get stuck in my condition. I can say, Lord, this is not going well. Or sometimes, you know, finances might get tight and you're looking at the books and they don't match up and you're saying, God... How in the world do we make it from day to day? You promised to give us our daily needs, but Lord, it looks tight here. You see all the problems after problems after problems. God, you, maybe your job's not stable, and, and you're saying, God, how do I navigate through this unemployment? And so all of a sudden, your condition, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and you've got all this stuff against you, and it is easy to say, God, this is not working. That's hopelessness. That's where Gideon was. And if you read the passage, you know what he did? The scripture says that when the angel of the Lord came, the angel says, man, you need to, you need to stop worrying about your condition. You've got to stop worrying about all of your pain and your problems. And you've got pandemics. You've got everything going on. Why are you so stuck in your condition? And so what the Lord did was, this. I mean, listen to this verse. It is so critical. Listen to what he says here in this verse. It says, it says, I mean, this blessed my heart. In verse 11, it says, the angel of the Lord came down and sat on the oak. And now listen to what it says. The angel says to, to Gideon, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. The angel did not talk about his condition. The angel looked at Gideon. And the angel says, mighty warrior. But Gideon, he said, wait a minute, I don't fear. All these people are ravaging the land. But the Lord said, but the, you don't need to be worried about all of that. You are somebody, Gideon. Stand up, you are a mighty warrior. 
Don't allow your condition to dictate your position. And I believe that maybe God is saying that to us this morning. I think sometimes we can come with so many problems and we can be just so overwhelmed by all of the conditions that we're going through. And the Lord is saying, take your eyes off of your condition. I got your back. I'll take care of that. You are somebody. Now, if I were getting, I would have picked up my knife and said, who, who do you want me to kill, Jesus? But, but that's not this. <laughs> the Lord was trying to distract him from this horrible condition and say, the Gideon, you're somebody. You're valued. You're loved by me. You are from the foundations of the world. I created you. I loved you. I care for you. Why are you worried about all this stuff you're going through? Don't you know that I'm here for you? And every once in a while, instead of me worrying about my condition, I got to worry, I got to think about God, I'm somebody. And I don't care what I'm going through, God, I'm still somebody. What I'm going through does not determine or change who I am. And so I'll think about, I'll think about Genesis 1, 7, where it says, I am made in the image of God. That God loves me so much that God made me in his image. And then I think about Psalms, you know, 139, 13, and 14, where it says that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm not thinking about my condition. No, because God made me fearfully and wonderfully. I start thinking about John chapter 1, verse 12, where it says that I am a child of God. Or I'll think about 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, where it says that I'm a new cre- creation. Or I'll think about, you know, Ephesians chapter, three, uh, chapter 2, verse 10, where it says, I am God's workmanship, his handiwork, made anew in him to do his work. You see, I am somebody, and God loves me and cares for me, and that's why I have hope in this place today. See, I can never allow my condition to dictate my position. And if you want to find people that are hopeless, they're always, they're always stuck in their condition. And what God says to us, I don't care, as you go into this world, you are ambassadors of hope. You are to remind people that God loves you and cares for you. You are somebody. And what you're going through, your condition, it never dictates your position. But there's something else I got to hear. Hey, man, hey, man, I got about, I got four minutes, but I'm here up. Is that all right? Listen to what else it says here. It says something else in here. And I thought this was so interesting. Now, now I'm going to read this for you. And when I read this for you, I mean, Gideon, to me, was probably the most trifling guy I've ever read about. In fact, if he was on a football team, he wouldn't be on mine. He was the biggest whiner and crybaby. I, have, I mean, he, I couldn't believe him. But now, you know what I did? I want you to, to, really, to really help you understand the impact of how hopeless Gideon was. There are two verses that talk about that Gideon speaks in the passage. Verses 13 and 15. I took 14 out because it was the father speaking. But verses 13 and 15, and I said, let me, I want to read to you real quick those two verses. And I want you to just really, just, I I I want you to hear this. It is probably the most depressing verses I've ever read. Listen to it, listen to what it says. So here's Gideon. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. And then here's the next verse. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. Up! You know what I said, Gideon, you must have been smoking some of that new Colorado uh, weed. <laughs> Don't you agree? This guy was hopeless. He couldn't see. Now, 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 now let me tell you, I, wanna, I, want, I wanna help you understand when you get around people without hope. Because really there are two issues that are driving the hopelessness. Can I, can I help you out real quick? Because I want you to see it. There are two things now, now, now whenever you come across people who are hopeless, first of all, the first sign is they have a victim's mentality. 
Amen, amen. You know, I know they don't have folk like this in Colorado. There, 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 there are three qualities in the victim. Listen to this victim mentality. The first thing is bad things have happened in the past and they will continue to happen to me. Oh, give them a bottle. That's what victims say. That because bad things have happened in the past, they're going to continue to happen. No! Don't you know you serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Lily of the Valley? Don't you know that God's got your back? How dare you say things are going to happen and going to continue to happen because they happened in the past. And any time you see a victim, they're always complaining, oh, woe is me. I'm just, you know, I'm no good. Oh, Lord, oh, look at me. Oh. And I'm like, ooh, you just make me want to puke. But anyway, <laughs> but there's something else whenever you run across a victim. Listen here, here's the second quality. They love to blame other people about what they're going through. Have you, see, I know you don't have them here in Colorado, but we got them in D.C. And so they love to blame other people. Oh, it's the government's fault. Oh, they didn't provide for me. Oh, it's my high school teacher's fault. Oh, I didn't have a daddy in my life, so it's his fault. Oh, it's his. And then they'll even come to church. Oh, it's the pastor's fault. It's his fault because I'm not growing. Get up off your lazy rump. Get in God's word and maybe you will grow. But they blame everybody. But that's the mindset of a victim. And Gideon is the classic victim. And then third, listen here. Listen, you got you to hear this. This is, there is no point of trying to make a change because it just won't work. Oh, uh-uh. Is that the typical victim? Now, some of you got these folk in your family, don't you? Amen, amen, amen. You just look at them and just say, that old lazy joker ain't doing nothing, ain't worth nothing, how in the world am I? See, you're trying to get them to do something. But that's how victims think. And so, so, so that's the first quality that Gideon had. And, then, and then, then there's another one that he had. I'm going to read the second verse. You'll see it. It's so clear. It is what I call negative self-talk. Now, I got to tell you, I struggle with depression. It's easy to get caught up in negative self-talk. Have you ever had negative self-talk? Have you ever done that before? Literally, where nobody else in the room, you're just talking to yourself. And you just start beating up on yourself. Don't listen to Gideon. No, no, he's got negative self-talk. Listen to what he says here with this negative self-talk. I mean, it is so critical. He says, pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. What? Who else? Who said that? <laughs> he said it. And so I, I got this quote. I just love this quote. Listen to what this quote said here about, about Gideon. It says, do not be a victim of negative self-talk. Remember who you are talking to. You missed that. Did that go over your head? Did that go over your head? You're talking to yourself. And you'll start believing it. And the one thing, and I hear people negative self-talk all the time. Look at me. I'm fat. Well, why is it that you're the only one saying that? I'm not pretty. You, you're the only one saying that. My clothes are not that good looking. We're always talking ourselves down, and that's a sign of hopelessness. And that's why you're so important here, because you are ambassadors of hope. You are there to say, wait a minute, who's telling you all of this information? Did the Holy Spirit give that to you? Of course not. You're talking to yourself. And so, what I, and so I quickly, once I read this passage, I identified what the problem was. And let me tell you what the problem is. Is that Gideon didn't have a handle on his own faith. Listen to what it says here. It says this here in verse 13. It says, pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to him? Where are all his wonders, listen, where are all his wonders, you got to listen, where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Wait a minute. He didn't have a hold of his own faith. Did you hear it? Where are all the wonders that our ancestors told us about? See, what Gideon is saying is, I went to Sunday school and they told me about the word that my ancestors did. He knew the word. 
He said, then I went, to, I went to small group, I went to prayer meetings, and I learned about the word. But just because Gideon learned about the word does not mean that he took ownership of the word. There are some of us here today, we have been going to church for a long time, and we really don't have a relationship with the Lord. You know why? Because we've not taken ownership of our faith. We're still just coming in here, getting a real little buzz, and then we go home. And at some point in your life, you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to take ownership of your faith. You're going to have to look to the heavens and say, God, you know what? I need to experience you for myself. I remember one of the things I do is I journal. I write down when I think God really moved in a mighty way in my life. And I remember when I first started journaling, I didn't, you know, the, the chaplain time, my buddy told me to do that. And, and, and I started journaling. I started writing down all these great moments. And I remember writing down when God, when I first went into the NFL and how God opened the door. I remember when I, when I got ready to retire and I felt all alone. And I journaled how God was with me and how God provided for me. I journaled about when I went to seminary and how God, he took care of my family and he provided for us even in seminary. And I can remember one day that when I had to go out and pastor a church and I was a little discouraged because it took a while for me to get a church. And all of a sudden, I went in and I met with the Lord. And I said, God, you know what? Now I am a little concerned. But Lord, you know, I know that you're going to come through for me. And this is what I did. I said, based upon when I went into the NFL, you provided for me. Based upon the fact that when I retired, you provided for me. Based upon the fact that when I got ready to, to, to leave seminary, you were there with me. Based upon everything that you've gone through and everything you've taken me through, based upon that, God, I know that I'm ready to move in a new direction. And I know you're going to be with me. You see, that's relationship. And so many people, you know the Bible stories, but you don't have relationship. And see, so before you go out to be ambassadors of hope, you know the first place that you need to start is, God, how in the world do I reconnect with you? How do I have this vibrant relationship with you so that I can qualify to be an ambassador of hope? You can't take hope into a world if you don't have a vibrant relationship with the Lord. You see, Gideon never took ownership of his faith. And even as you go out into the world today, the greatest thing you can do is to say, God, I'm going to take ownership of my faith and I'm going to fall so deeply in love. You may need some help in trying to work and figure that out. Maybe you can talk to one of the pastors or your small group leader or a friend that you know that's godly. But you cannot go in and know all the stories and not have relationship. It just doesn't work. And that's why Gideon was in the place that he was in. And then finally, amen, 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 amen. And then finally, I got, one other pl I got one other point. I'm going to get out of here. Is that all right? No? Okay, listen, 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 listen. I got one other thing I want to say to you, and I'm out of here, I promise you. But listen to this. And so the third one is, the peacemaker that walks in hope magnifies God and not themselves or their problems. Now let me tell you why I say this. It's easy once you read these two verses to figure out what Gideon's problem is. Certainly he didn't have ownership of his, of his faith, but there's something even bigger, much bigger. Gideon had a pronoun problem. Amen, amen, amen. I'm going to tell you what I'm talking about. It's amen. He had a pronoun problem. See, pronouns are the enemy of our faith. And if when you start using too many pronouns, you are going to run into problems. Now, let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to read this passage and these two verses again. And, and now, 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 now listen, every time I come across a pronoun that refers to Gideon or Israel, I want you to count for me. Is that okay? Well, maybe I need to tell you what a pronoun is. Is that all right? I mean, a pronoun is a me, my, I. They can be personal. They can be plural. And so anytime it's referring back to the person Gideon or the people of Israel, that pronoun is referring to them. Us, me, my, I, we. So would you help me out real quick? Yes. Okay, come on. So here it goes. So I'm going to, so check out these pronouns. I'm going to read these two verses 
And I want you to count real loud when I come across one. Or every time, here it is. Pardon me. Oh, you're so edumacated. Oh, you really are. You really are. Okay, so we'll start off. Pardon me. My. Oh, Lord. Well, maybe I need to teach you how to count. Is that all right? I thought we just said one. Okay, we can, let's start over. Let's start over. Okay, come on. Let me, let me get it. Pardon me. My. Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers, ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Verse 15. Pardon me, my Lord Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. Mm, mm, mm. Fifteen pronouns in two verses. I mean, don't you think that even Grammatically, that's a problem. <laughs> Fifteen times Gideon, this hopeless brother, is pointing back to himself. Now, can I just show you real quick what happens when you use those types of pronouns? My house. My children. Our children. My school, my job, my stock, my bar, bonds, oh yes, yeah, yeah, and my car, and, and, and my store, my money, my, me, my, I. <laughs> Guess what happens to you when you get stuck in pronouns? You get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. What happens to God? Up! God gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Maybe what the angel of the Lord was trying to teach Gideon about hope is that if you're going to have hope or if you're going to be an ambassador of hope, you're going to stop focusing on you and put the focus on God. God must get bigger, King of kings, Lord of lords, Amen. lily of the valley, bright and morning star, alpha, omega, beginning, the end, first, last, my joy, my sorrow, my hope, my tomorrow. <laughs> see, see, God gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But guess what happens to Gideon? Oh, come on now. He gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And maybe that's what David says over in, in, in the 30, Psalms 34. Maybe David was right when he says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. That's what David says. Come and let us exalt him together. Oh, man. Have you ever had a magnifying glass? No, really, I'm trying to help you. Listen, what happens when you place a magnifying glass over an object? Yeah, you got it. And as you pull it back, guess what happens to it? It gets larger and larger and larger and larger. That's what David is suggesting. He said, if you're going to be ambassadors of hope, you must start with saying, how do I get God bigger and bigger and bigger in my life. And I become smaller and smaller and smaller. If you're going to be ambassadors of hope, God's got to be bigger. That is the great challenge, even, even for our team that's going to be going to Puerto Rico. They're not going there just to simply pass our tracks. 
They're going there to say, God, we want you to get bigger and bigger and bigger while we become smaller and smaller and smaller. God's going to open these doors for him, for, for, for him to be magnified and for him to be lifted up and for him to be honored like never before. And that's what God is doing for you. He's saying, ah, you've got to make me bigger. Isn't that something? And so the key then maybe is not for Gideon, but maybe the key is for you. Maybe God is asking you this morning, if you're going to bear hope, how's your relationship with him? How's your relationship with him? Do you really have a good handle on to your faith? Are you really allowing him to be big in your life? Because when you allow him to get bigger, you take your mind off your conditions and you understand the importance of your position. You know, I came here this morning and, 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 and I'm looking so forward to, to this team that's going to Puerto Rico. But they're going to Puerto Rico. But guess what? He's sending you to Colorado. All throughout, it's no different. They're not doing a special mission. All of us are doing a special mission. All of us are going into a field to offer hope and to extend hope into a world that's hurting. And so I just want to take a minute. We're going to let them minister, and I'm going to come back in just a minute. So Wendy, tell us a little bit about this crew, what they've been doing over the last six months as they're preparing and where, what, what we're doing, where we're going. Yes, so we have an amazing, incredible team of 19 people who uh, were going to Puerto Rico for the very first time. Um, they've been training for this trip, um, some of them going on a trip for the very first time. Um, they've committed to this trip, they're leaving behind work, family, other commitments. Um, so we are just going to join in the work that the Happy Givers are already doing. Um, and we're Happy Givers excited. is one of our partners in Hope. Yes. So we support them through our Partners in Hope giving, which many of you do. And uh, Carlos was here for the gala. this past year for the gala and spoke 
what are some of the things that the groups can, I mean, obviously you're going to go fix everything, right? You're going to go, we have the answers. We're going to go take, I mean, this classic, wonderful American evangelicalism, like mission minded, we're going to fix all the problems. How do they even survive without us? Yes. So that's what, so now what are, what's the ethos of the trip? What do you hope for all these folks and for the trip? Um, we are not going to pass out tracks. <laughs> um, and so we are going to build relationships. We are going to encounter Puerto Rico. Um, we're going to build relationships. We're going to go fall in love with the people of Puerto Rico and we're going to come back and tell people what great things they're doing there. We're hoping that the people will um, fall in love and come back and do the same thing in our community here and serve our community here. Um, so yeah, it's all about relationships and we're going to go back and do it again next year. And, we're, and we take the lead from our partners that are on the ground doing work day in and day out there. That's we right. come in and it's just kind of like, how can we learn and be a part of what you're That's doing? That's right. We don't come with a mission in hand saying this is what we're going to do. We already do. We just jump in and what they're already doing on the ground. That's awesome. I love it. And when you all come back, there's an opportunity for people to hear about it? Yeah, there's two opportunities. You can join us on this trip by, there's a card in your program. Um, you can join us on the trip by praying for us every day. We're experiencing new things. This is our very first time, so you can pray for us every day. And then when we get back, um, you can join us for a night of storytelling on March 21st and hear all about the stories of the trip. I love it. That's so wonderful. Very good. Well, do me a favor. Would you all stand up with us this morning? And uh, we're going to pray, and then we're going to sing this song. Ricky's going to give us some closing thoughts, bless us on our way out. But let's take a moment just pray. And it's such a good reminder that Oftentimes in church world, we have this moment where we bring these folks up because they're going into a different space, right? And it can mean as if we're saying, this is the real work. This is so awesome. You're only really bringing hope if you do things like this. But the truth is, this is such a small, it's just unique. And we celebrate that uniqueness. But every one of us is called to do what Ricky said, to be that ambassador of hope. To, where are you going to be tomorrow? Right? That's kind of rule number five in our rule of life that we're talking about is create hope. That's the commitment that we make. And so while we're praying, they're going to be on a plane on Tuesday night, Wednesday. But where are you going to be on Tuesday? Where are you going to be on Wednesday? Because that's really what this is about, right? Remembering that these folks are in a new experience and we want to cover them in prayer and be mindful of them. That's another one of our rule of life, to be mindful. We want to be mindful of them. But that does not mean that what we're doing, what you're doing on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, where you work, where you care for your family, right? Where you neighbor that that is not of equal, if not more important, because there's so much influence that we have there. All right, so let's pray. Lord, we're so grateful for uh, Wendy and her leadership with this group of people. We're grateful for their commitment to come together, to get to know one another. We're grateful for the Happy Givers, the organization that's there in Puerto Rico on the ground that's been doing relief work and development since uh, for, for many years. But Lord, we're especially grateful that they're there right now, even post-hurricane, and they've been working hard serving that community. Lord, open our eyes and open our hearts. I pray that our entire church would be present with this group of 19 as representatives to come back, to encourage us in our generosity, to encourage us in our prayers, to encourage us in our way of peace and our participation with what you're doing and how you're present there in Puerto Rico through the work of Happy Givers. So be an encouragement to these folks. I pray, God, that their journey would be filled with just amazing divine opportunities where hearts would be transformed, where relationships would begin to be formed. And Lord, may we, as a community of faith, may we be motivated to go out and be those people that we've been waiting for, that we would be those who have experienced this depth of hope, and we would then go and give it as well. We pray for safety. We pray for life transformation. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Give him a great big hand. Let's sing the rest of this song together. Broken bells, broken church, a heart that hurts is a heart that works. In a broken place, it's where the victory is won. Cause you faith and no fear for the fight You pull hope from defeat in the night There's an image of you in my mind Could be mad but you might just be right We are the people we've been waiting for Out 
of the ruins of hate and war Army of lovers never seen before We are the people we've been waiting for We are the people of the open hand Streets of Dublin to Notre Dame We'll build it better than we did before We are the people we've been waiting for We are the people we've been waiting for Amen. Give God a hand clap. You know, I am so excited about this team that's going out. And I really say that they're just like you. They're the same as you are, but they have one difference. They're going to a very different environment. Amen, amen. And they're going, and they're going to have to take risk, and they're going to play, be in places. They're going to feel uncomfortable. God's going to take them out of their comfort zone. Two very different missions, but yet the same mission. And so your prayers are imperative that you pray for them every day as God brings them to your heart because you are ambassadors of hope. That's not what you do. That's who you are. That God has called you to go in and bring salt and light into this wonderful world. And so please pray for them. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I bless my brothers and sisters. I pray, I bless them that they might open their spiritual eyes, that even as you lead people across their face, people that need to be encouraged, people that need hope, I pray that your Holy Spirit will open their eyes that they will not miss them. Father, I bless them in their relationship with you, that they can sense your promptings and sense where you, the directions in which you're pointing them. And therefore, Jesus, I submit and commit them all to you. These are your children. You love them. They are valuable to you. You care so much about them. And so, Father, as we leave, Father, I pray that we all leave to impact the world like never before. Till you be honor, glory, and praise in your name. Amen. 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 Give Ricky a great big hand. Don't go anywhere, Ricky. Thank you. Thank you, brother. So, uh, Take a few minutes, hang out together. We've got hot dogs. Mm. They're $40 each, just like at the stadium. <laughs> it all goes to a good cause. No, yeah. no, no. To him. Free hot dogs <laughs> out there in the atrium. So grab a hot dog and hang out for a few moments together. Uh, one more time, just thank Ricky for being Amen. here with us today. Thank you. And uh, again, uh, we just, th we just want you to have some fun. Have a great time celebrating with friends and family today. Uh, have a great time with the Super Bowl. Uh, and have a great time in the atrium. And let's, let's do some Don't Stop Believing one more time. What do you say? We'll give you some walkout music. A little Don't Stop Believing. All right, here we go. Have a great day, everyone. Bless you.